Good morning, Tyrone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to be together with you. Another beautiful morning. And uh, well done for remembering the clocks. The watch that I have sitting here says half past nine. So I try to finish about half past eleven, so. <laughs> Twice as long today. Um, not at all. Uh, so, we need to say happy something today. Happy Christmas? Christmas. Happy Easter? Easter yet? Anyone tell me? Happy Spring? Uh, absolutely. That's a good one. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy Spring? Happy anything else? Happy Mo who said that? Hey! Happy Mother's Day! I don't know you, baby. Who said that? A mother. Ah, oh, yes, a mother. <laughs> Sorry, this is what is it? My mom. That's your mom. Yes. So it's Happy Mother's Day, as well as Happy New Year and Happy Spring. It's Happy Mother's Day today. So Happy Mother's Day to any of you who are mothers. And uh, one or two men would be a bit shocked. Oh, no. <laughs> There's plenty of daffodils going wild. <laughs> anyway, great to be here. Beautiful morning. A lot to be thankful for. Um, we come to see God. We're going to sing in Psalm 62 in the red. Well, not the red. I've got the red book here. We're going to sing it. We're going to sing it in two parts. Uh, so we'll sing the whole of it over in two parts. We're going to sing verses 1 to 6 just now. And um, this is a psalm about. Just what is true uh, and what isn't. There are people in this psalm who are false. Verse 4, they take delight in spreading lies with false and flattering mouths they bless. But then there's God, God himself who is true, my safety, my fortress, my sheltering rock. So we'll sing verses 1 to 6 of them of this psalm. Let's stand. And let's sing together. My
Go Hawks. I wonder what's in the box. I wonder what's in that. I need someone to to, to to tell me. I need some volunteers. I'm going to go for adults just now because I know we'll go for kids at the end. Who but adults? Any any adults like to volunteer? Just tell me what's in the box. You come up and have a look and tell everyone what's in the box. Anyone want to volunteer? Anyone? Richard? Okay. Richard? Okay. Excellent. <coughs> this, uh, this is Richard. Uh, Richard, you all know, an upstanding member of the community. Yeah. What's in the box? Yeah. Do you not know if breakfast is mine? A fried breakfast. That's not fair. Yeah. A fried breakfast. What, what's in the oh, box? Yeah, it's a sausage in there. You breakfast yet? What, what's in the box? A sausage. A sausage. Wait, wait, no, no. Are you going to sit down? You'll get your chance. You'll get your chance. Okay, thanks, Richard. Right. Anyone tell me what's in the box? Anyone tell me what's in the box? A sausage. Yeah, it's a sausage. Minus, is anyone? Anyone agree with mine? It didn't go well last time we did that. Didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A draft excluder. A draft excluder. <laughs> that really is off the wall, like, my, literally. Sausage. It's a sausage. Okay. Oh, I see that kind of sausage. Ah, right. Yes, yes. A draft excluder sausage. Okay. Another volunteer come and tell me what's in the box. Oh, really? Another outstanding member of the congregation, where you put some balls. You do have a spec savers. Pair of slippers. What? Pair of slippers. Pair of slippers. Okay. <laughs> right. What's in the box for? Can anyone tell me now? You don't know, Alison? Not sure? Toss-up between the sausage and a sausage. Okay. <laughs> right, so that's Alison. Oh, is she right? Is it a toss-up between a sausage and a pair of slippers? What do you think? What's in the box? Hands up, you think it's a sausage. Hands up, you think it's a pair of slippers? Oh, my goodness, not even got his hand up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, well, you're all, you're all getting too wise to my ploys these days, aren't you? Um, we think we don't yet know what's in the, in the box. Okay, okay. Right. How are you doubters going to find out what's in the box? You're going to look? Okay, will we ask Linda to look? Yeah? No, no. Okay. You want to ask her? You want to go take her, take her out, show her the way to the box? Ask Linda over there with colourful buttons. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's it. Yeah? That's, that's Linda. This is Linda here. <laughs> There you go. There's Linda there, look. See? Aha. No, oh, there. <laughs> That's it. You take, you take Linda around. Show her where the box is. She doesn't know. Okay. Right. You guys go and tell us what's in the box. See which one was right, Richard or Willie. Teddy. It's a teddy. What's in the box, Linda? It's
by listening to Richard. Mm. Or listening to Willie. Okay. How did Linda find out it was in the box? And uh, Patrick, too. How did he find out it was in the box? You looked for yourself. That's right. Now, this is important because every one of us hears people say things all the time. All the time we're hearing people say things and we've got to think, is that right? Is that true? And sometimes the only way to really know is to go and have a look yourself in the box. Or sometimes it's not the box, sometimes it's in the What's this book here? Hey? Uh, yeah, in the Bible. Sometimes it's in the Bible that we need to look. And in the Bible, we will read about Jesus for ourselves. And maybe at Sunday school as well, you're reading with the teacher. You can read about Jesus for yourself. Because when you're out and about, you'll hear people like Maybe some of your friends at school, or for the adults, uh, maybe someone you see on television, and you'll hear people speaking about Jesus sometimes, and they'll say all sorts of stuff about him, and you'll think, it's not right. And that's a good thing to think about Jesus. Is it right? And the only way you can go and find out is to look for yourself, and not let other people tell you when they haven't maybe looked for themselves, but maybe they've just listened to someone else. Like if we all listen to Willie or Richard, we still don't know who's in the box. Uh, and uh, sometimes you listen to people and what they say on television or what they say in the playground or what they say in co-op or whatever it is, wherever you're meeting people. And they say stuff, but they've never actually gone and looked themselves at Jesus. And the only way to really find out is to go and look for yourself and see Jesus, our wonderful and our glorious Savior, for yourself. Don't let other people tell you. Go and find out who he is in the Bible for yourself. Let's pray together. Lord, we bow before you. And we thank you for this holy day, and we thank you for one another and the love that we have for one another. And we thank you for this chance for each one of us to go and have a look for ourselves at Jesus and to find out who he is. And with people like Peter and Andrew and James and John and all the followers of Jesus, Find out for ourselves that he is your son and that he died for our sins and that he rose up from the dead and he lives forevermore to help us. So help us to look for ourselves and find him for ourselves. We pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to sing that. A little chorus which asks God to open our eyes so that uh, we can see who He is. Here we go. Very simple little chorus, which I learned a long time ago. Hope some of you know it, because uh, uh, Heather didn't know it, so if Heather doesn't know it, then uh, quite likely quite a few doesn't want it. Anyone know that one? You know what? Yeah, that's good. Do you want to lead it on? <laughs> Not yet. But you can give me good strength. Okay, very simple tune. Very simple quiet tune. We'll sing it through twice. So uh, let's stand. Let's stand and sing.
Okay, so let's uh, read now from God's Word in John chapter 7. We're going to read the whole of this chapter together. John 7. <clears throat> After this, Jesus went around in Galilee, purposely staying away from Judea. So Galilee's in the north and Judea's in the south. He's staying away from Judea where Jerusalem is because the Jews there, the Jewish leaders that is, were waiting to take his life. But when the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, Jesus' brothers said to him, you ought to leave here and go to Judea so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. But even his own brothers did not believe in him. Therefore Jesus told them, The right time for me has not yet come. For you, any time is right. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify that what it does is evil. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast, because for me the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. However, after his brothers had left for the feast, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now at the feast, the Jews were watching for him and asking, Where is that man? Among the crowds, there was widespread whispering about him. Some said, He is a good man. Others replied, No, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews. Not until halfway through the feast did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having studied? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. He who speaks on his own does so to gain honour for himself, but he who works for the honour of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There is nothing false about him. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? You are demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? Jesus said to them, I did one miracle and you are all astonished. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, though actually it did not come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a child on the Sabbath. Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, and make a right judgment. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is, speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Christ? But we know where this man is from. When the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I am from. I am not here of my own, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. At this they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his time had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd put their faith in him. They said, When the Christ comes, will he do more miraculous signs than this man? The Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and then I go to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go, that we cannot find him? Will he go where our people live, scattered among the Greeks, and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said, you will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, 
If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not yet been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Christ. Still others asked, How can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say that the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus, the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards declared. You mean he has deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Has any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse in them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet has not come out of Galilee. Amen. Well, this is God's word, and may he himself reach a blessing into your life and my life. Let's come to God again and pray. Let's, let's pray. <coughs> Lord God, we, we bow in your presence. We thank you for the words that we just read. It is really amazing that we're brought in that chapter right into Jerusalem, right in among the crowds. We can feel the, the action, the pressure, the questioning, the speculation, as we, in our mind's eye, picture the scene. And we want to ask the Lord today that you will help us to take the position, not of the doubters, the questioners, but of those who, like Nicodemus, listened carefully to what Jesus had to say and came to the conclusion that he was and that he is the Son of God. We thank you, Lord, today that we are able to come together in freedom to worship. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the, the gifts that you've given to us today. And we thank you for one another, for our families, our friends, our community, the people we work with. We thank you, Lord, for the people that we carry in our hearts and we're just thinking of those we mentioned, we pray for Murder Gordon and the wider family. We pray for Ian McLennan and his uh, family and we pray for Donnie G as well, Debbie and all the family, Heavenly Father in their different circumstances. Have mercy upon the Lord and reach out into their lives according to the deep needs that they have. Uh, we know what deep needs are ourselves, and we know that you have met with us at times of crisis, and sometimes those times which were our worst turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as you revealed yourself to us, a faithful father and friend, good, gentle, kind, and gracious. We worship you, Lord, that you are able to bring light out of darkness. We pray this morning, Lord, that we will reach out to this troubled world where there's many places that are full of unimaginable suffering at this time. And uh, we're very conscious of Ukraine and the refugees that are streaming out of there into the surrounding countries. So much news about what someone thinks or what someone else thinks and who's going to do what and so much speculation but Heavenly Father you have a purpose in all of this please reach down we pray 
and your great, great love and mercy just into all the hearts that are in need at this time. And bless your church, Lord, seeking to minister in the midst of this situation. And Heavenly Father, and please we pray that love, peace, and truth will ultimately prevail out of this man-made disaster. We're sorry, Lord. We're part of mankind ourselves, and we know that we find things in our hearts that are not right, and yet we still condemn others for what's not right in their hearts. Heavenly Father, we all need your forgiveness and your great mercy. This whole world needs an outpouring of your grace and mercy. Let us all, as Jesus pled with us, come to you and drink. Lord, help us now. We bring the things that are in our own minds and hearts before you. And uh, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you will work in our lives today, that you will speak your word of gospel peace, and that we will hear your voice now, and not harm our hearts, but receive you. Hear our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to sing now from the rest of Psalm 62. We were singing from a minute ago. And again, the psalm is about who we listen to. And uh, <clears throat> there's low born people to listen to in this psalm, high born people, but uh, people who seek wealth by force and all sorts. But God has spoken. And it's to him we turn, and it's, to, it's him we listen to. I have heard that you are strong and loving, Lord. Verse 7 to the end of Psalm 62 now, to God's grace. Let's start with the <coughs> know ourselves everything or do we listen 
to others and learn from them. So this is the last of the short series I've just done about what we know, we've been thinking about what we know about the world that we are in and about other people and about ourselves and about God. And this chapter is all about this. This chapter is all about, if you turn back to John 7, it's all about listening and learning and finding out and making sure that what we know is correct. Making sure we know, as we said to the kids, for ourselves, what's in the box, what's in the Bible, who Jesus is, and not just letting second hand uh, views inform us. I'm often disturbed in this community uh, when I see so many people who have attended church in an earlier part of their lives, but no longer do so. And somehow or other have just missed who Jesus is and seem to have made up their minds that they know who Jesus is when they clearly don't. Because if they knew who Jesus was, uh, not only would they they'd be involved in church, but they themselves would be uh, devoted to him. But they don't know who Jesus is, and yet they think they do because they went to church when they were kids and when they were younger. And that's disturbing. It's disturbing that people can make up their minds about Jesus without ever actually really hearing who he really is. And that cha this chapter here is all about that. And we're going to focus in on Nicodemus' words in verse 51. So when Nicodemus stands up for Jesus, the Pharisees are condemning Jesus. And Nicodemus, who is a Pharisee, um, asks, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? Does our law condemn without first listening? And Nicodemus is saying to his fellows, Gentlemen, you're not listening. You're not listening to Jesus. And you're condemning and you're making up your mind without listening. And society does that. There's lots and lots of people who think they know about Jesus, they have an opinion about him, but they've never actually listened to Jesus himself. And Christians too can make this mistake. Very easily. I think we've been finding that out on Wednesday nights as we've been looking at the book Gentle and Lowly. And people have been saying, you know, I've seen Jesus' character in a new light. I've seen God's character in a new light through this book. It's like we had this idea of who God was and we decided this is our God. But by listening carefully, we've decided actually we don't really understand his character as clearly as we could do. And we're finding out more, and it's enriching us, and it's, it's great. Because sometimes in life, and I made this mistake, I've already said this recently, I made this mistake myself when I was ill. You know, I, I thought God was treating me harshly. Not only that, but other people were telling me God was treating me harshly. And I remember a couple of people in one week both said to me, uh, Your God's not looking after you very well just now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Thinking that is, is showing, and if I was thinking that, it was showing that I didn't really grasp God's character properly as I want to do. And to do that, we've got to listen. And I've been trying since, I've been able to think more clearly again since the transplant operation, to think about God's character and to learn, and I have learned a great deal, uh, of new things that have been really blessed to me and I've had to say sorry to God on many, many occasions for the ways I've gone wrong. So I'm going to use this chapter today just briefly to have a look at some of the ways in which people make up their minds without really knowing what they're talking about. And it might help you because you might be someone that, you know, you've, you've come into church thinking, well, I, I come to church, but I know what I know what it's all about. And maybe you may see that 
actually sometimes that's the greatest danger. It's when we think we know God and we think we know about Jesus that we start growing. Instead of coming to God and saying, God, I've begun to learn, but I need to listen more carefully to you. Uh, I need to make sure that my knowledge of you is right. And it may help you also to recognize the people around you and where they go wrong in their thinking about God. So let's look at just a few things quickly. First of all, let's think about uh, verse 3 and 4 uh, in chapter 7 of John. So this is Jesus' brothers. Now Jesus had four brothers. And next week I'm going to start a series about the church in Jerusalem. And we'll be reading in chapter 1 of the book of Acts. And Jesus' brothers in chapter 1 of the book of Acts are right in the thick of things in the church because Jesus has risen from the dead and they've believed in him. But here they don't. It says in verse 5, his own brothers didn't yet believe in him. And so they say to him in verse 3, you ought to leave Galilee and go down to Judea to Jerusalem for the feast so that your disciples may see the miracles you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. So they have made up their minds about their brother, Jesus. They made up their minds that what he really wants, what Jesus really wants, is to become a public figure. They've decided on his motivation. And that is a very challenging thing to, to try and do, is decide on the motivation of Jesus or the motivation of God. But they've decided, from what they've seen so far, and the miracles Jesus has done, and, and the teaching Jesus has given, and the crowds Jesus has attracted, they have made up their mind. Hey, our brother wants to be a big shot. He wants to be a big leader. He wants to be uh, the leader of the nation, a public figure. And of course, that's completely wrong. That's not what Jesus' motivation is, because that's a selfish motivation. Wanting to be someone big and important. That's not who Jesus is at all. So the brothers have for whatever reason, made up their minds about Jesus. Somehow, they've spent 30 years with him and they haven't listened. They haven't listened to Jesus. Sometimes that's what happens even for people who are in the church, that something happens in our lives and we think God's been bad to me. God's been harsh. God's treated me unfairly. And we make up our minds on God's motivation. You know, God, God's wanting to, to mistreat me in some way. And somehow we think that we know what we're talking about when we don't. Have we looked into God's heart? Well, God's heart is full of love. Whatever he does in our lives, as a loving motivation. And if we make up our minds in a different way than, than that, eh, and as people often do, <coughs> we'll go all wrong. We need to listen. And the brothers somehow haven't done that. They made up their minds. Here's another example. Eh, this is in verses 6 and verse 8. <coughs> Jesus told his brothers, the right time for me has not yet come, the right time to go down to the feast. For you, any time is right. And again he says in verse 8, You go up to the feast, I'm not yet going up to the feast, because for me, the right time has not yet come. So, Jesus is working by a schedule, by a timetable that is God's timetable for him. And there's a right time for everything. God works in our lives like that as well. He's got time <coughs> for everything in our lives. But for us, who don't know that timetable, we like to decide what it is for ourselves. We like to say to God, God, um, now's the time you should come and help me. Now's the time you should work in this situation. Now's the time you should fix this. We like to decide in God's timing. And as Jesus says for us, any time is right, and usually our time is now. Come on, God, this is bad, fix it now. 
And when he doesn't fix it, now we get unhappy with him. And that's our fault, not his fault. It's our fault for deciding on his timetable when it's not his timetable. And that's what the brothers are doing as well. Another mistake. Mistaken thinking. When we make up our minds without listening first to Jesus, to God. Here's a, another example. This is about opinions. So verse 12 and verse 13. Among the crowds there was widespread whispering about Jesus. Some said, he's a good man. Others replied, no, he deceives the people. But no one would say anything publicly about him for fear of the Jews, the Jewish leaders. And again in verse 40, 41. On hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. Others said, he is the Christ. Still others, how can the Christ come from Galilee? So, What's happening is there's this big crowd at the feast, and Jesus is there, and they've got lots of different opinions about him. You know, there's some people saying um, he's a good man, and you know he's a bad man, and he's a prophet, he's a Christ, and he's nobody. They've got all sorts of opinions about Jesus. But we know their opinions because it says no one would say anything publicly about him for fear. People are never prepared to die for their opinions, are they? They die for their convictions. And convictions about Jesus can only be gained by actually listening personally to him. And Christians throughout the, the centuries since this time have sometimes been called to die for Jesus because in the situation in which they live, they're so badly oppressed by the authorities that the authorities want them to turn away from Jesus as Lord because the authorities believe they are Lord and not Jesus. And so they put pressure on the Christians. But the Christians are not Christians because they've got an opinion about Jesus. They're Christians because they have convictions about Jesus. And we ask ourselves today, are we people who have convictions about Jesus? Are we really people who know, yes, I absolutely know who my Savior is and he is Lord. Or are we people who have an opinion? No, nah, he's a good man, he's a bad man, he's the Christ, he's a prophet. <clears throat> There's a difference between opinions and convictions. We saw it illustrated vividly a couple of weeks ago by a very, very brave uh, news editor, Marina of Shalikova, I think was her name. And there on uh, the Russian propaganda television station. She stood behind the newsreader with a placard saying, don't listen to this propaganda, it's all lies, they're lying to you here. We don't want the war. Now, I think every one of us who saw that thought, that's a brave woman. That's a very brave woman. And the things that she said on that placard were not opinions. They were convictions, because she knew that she'd get into trouble. Maybe a lot of trouble. I think actually it seems that so far she seems to have got off rather late from what might have happened. But who knows what will happen in the due course to her. What bravery. The bravery comes out of convictions. And convictions come out of listening to Jesus. That's what we need to do. We need to put aside our assumptions we need to put aside the things that we've made up our minds about and just tune into him. Listen for ourselves. Don't get second-hand opinions. Listen for yourself and gain conviction that way. Here's another example. Verse 15. The, Jew, the Jewish leaders were amazed and asked, how did Jesus get such learning? without having studied. And uh, again, in verse 49, they say, this mob, the crowd, knows nothing of the law. There's a curse in them. Now, what's happening here is that the Jewish leaders, the Pharisees uh, as well, have decided that 
the only people that really know about God are people who have gone to university, people who have gone to college, people who have studied, uh, or whatever the equivalent was of that in their day. Uh, there were schools of learning for the Pharisees, there were two main leaders uh, among the Pharisees of that time, and they, they, they could go to school and they could study like Saul of Tarsus did for many years and get great learning. And the Saul of Tarsus had great learning. He didn't know God. He didn't know Jesus until he met him on the road to Damascus. And there are many people today, and we think, well, we've got to listen to these people because they've got a PhD. Because they're professors, so and so. Because they've, they've studied a lot. But often people who've studied are just as ignorant of the realities of God and of Jesus as people who left school when they were 14 or 12 or whatever. But sometimes the people who left school when they were 12 or 14 know far more about God than the people with the PhDs because they've listened. It's not about your qualifications. It doesn't matter whether you've you know, going to school or not, going to college or not, going to university or not, you know, whether you're a great scholar or not. That is not the thing that makes up the, the, the reality of what you know about God. It's just how you as a person listened carefully to God yourself. And Jesus didn't go to any of the schools of learning at all. But what he did do, and he tells us this in verse 16, he says, my teaching is not my own. It comes from him who sent me. Jesus has been listening very, very carefully all through his life to his heavenly Father. And because of that, he knows God, his Father. And when he speaks about God, his Father, he's speaking with all the reality of a person who is in a an intimate relationship as the Son with the Father and just knows what it's like and what it's about. We all have relationships, we can talk about relationships, we can talk about you know, our parents or our wives or our husbands or whatever, and we talk about them with great clarity and great authority because we know them. Well, Jesus was like that with, with God his Father. <clears throat> he listened and he knew his Father. And that is what we need to do too. So when they're amazed, as verse 15 says, by Jesus, they're amazed because the difference is these guys that got all the learning, they've never listened to, they've never listened to God. And Jesus, who hasn't got the learning, the letters after his name, if you like, but he's been listening to his father all his life. And he really knows what he's talking about in a way that others just cannot. And so the guards in verse 46 reckon, recognize this. No one ever spoke the way this man does. And nothing truer could be said. The problem with so many people today uh, who speak about God and who say, oh, there's no God, or they, you know, they, they, they've, they've got great learning. They're professors, they're, they're, they're intelligent people, and think, people think, oh, they must be right. But they never listen to God. And it's like that uh, apprentice quote that's been going around recently. Again, um, you don't know how much you don't know because you don't know. And that's the way it is with even many of the most smart people in our country. They don't know how much they don't know about God because they just don't know. And yet they still speak about it and give their opinions, but they know nothing because they haven't listened. Like the Jewish leaders here, and one of their number, Nicodemus, rebukes him and says, does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he's doing? They've already made up their minds. But Nicodemus says, you can't do that. You've got to sit at his feet. You've got to listen and learn from Jesus. One more thing I can mention here. We could spend a lot of time more on this chapter just talking about this. But we've spoken about God's motivation. What about our motivation? Well, Jesus says in verse 18, 
he who speaks on his own does so to gain honour for himself. But he who works for the honour of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. Whenever you hear someone speak about God and about Jesus, just ask yourself, whose honour are they seeking at this moment? Now, if you see one of the great atheist figures saying, ah, oh, there's no God, ask yourself, whose honour are they seeking? Of course, they're pruning themselves in their own learning. You can ask yourself, what about me? Whose honour is Roddy see? And that's something I need to tremble about because I need to listen to the words of Jesus myself. I've got to seek his honour, he sent me, and not my own. It's one of the greatest temptations in, in preaching. And, and I know that all of preachers succumb to this temptation. It's to cross the line from seeking Jesus' honour through what you see, to just want to show me of how good you are yourself, how, how learned you are, how much you know. It's a temptation. And it's something we must be very careful about. And all of us, you know, ask ourselves, if this person has got this great opinion about God, whose honour are they seeking? And if they're not seeking the honour of God with what they see, then they don't know what they're talking about. It's all about themselves. It's all about their own opinion. That's what Jesus says here. It's all about seeking honour for their, themselves, glory for themselves. But when you see a man or woman who's learned what it is to tremble before God because he or she knows God and has met God and they speak about God, you think, well, this person is not saying this for their own sake. They're saying it because they know what they're talking about. They know God for themselves. And that's what we all must try to do. We must seek to know God for ourselves. You know, don't take someone else's word for what's in the box. You need to go and have a look yourself. You need to ask. And who could be more inviting of our asking than Jesus himself? On this last great day of the feast, in verse 37, he stood and he said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that wonderful? Jesus said, you know, if, I'm thir if you're thirsty, I'm the one you can come to. I'm the one who can satisfy, I'm the one with the answers, I'm the one with the truth. And you and I need to be like Nicodemus. Remember it says Nicodemus, John chapter 3, went to Jesus at night and he listened. He listened to Jesus. That's chapter 3. In chapter 7 here, he's standing up for Jesus and he's getting a mouthful of abuse for it. And at the end of John's Gospel, he appears again as one of the men that goes to take down the body of Jesus from the cross to have him buried. Nicodemus listened. Nicodemus didn't just condemn because his friends were condemning Jesus. He thought for himself. And he went to Jesus and listened to what Jesus was saying. And when he listened, something wonderful happened. His heart was changed. And that's what we believe God does. And that's why you and I want to get people reading the Bible and listening for themselves. Because when they do that, Jesus can speak into their hearts. And no longer are they getting an opinion from someone else. No longer are they listening to some big wig on the television telling them what to think. They're listening to Jesus for themselves and he works in their hearts and gives them convictions, living water, life and hope and forgiveness and peace. And so Jesus says to you and he says to me this morning, you know, 
don't make up your mind about me without coming and meeting with me first and listening carefully to me and finding out who I am. Because when you do that, you're coming to the living water and that living water will flow into you too and refresh you. Find out for yourself. Come for yourself. Even if you've been a long time going to church, you know, not really changed in any way, you just come and come and come. Take time to go and listen to Jesus, to sit at his feet, and not make up your mind, but rather listen carefully to what he's saying. And then let him speak the words of life into your heart and draw you into himself and his life forevermore. Let's pray for a moment now. Let's just close in prayer. <coughs> Lord, please forgive us for when we have made up our mind about you without really listening in all sorts of ways. Please help us, Jesus, when we have uh, troubles and questions just to open our Bibles and listen to what you're saying to us. Because Lord, we know that you can speak in ways that no one else can and that you can reach down into places in our lives which no one else can reach. And you can pour in that living water, that life into us that will move us from opinions and hearsay to convictions and commitment and eternal life. Hear our prayers, Jesus, and help us in the week ahead and all that we face and all the challenges we have for your sake. Amen. <coughs> We're going to sing uh, now in the hymn, We Have Heard a Joyful Sound. And uh, so that's really where we've come to in this study. We have heard a joyful sound. Jesus says, we, we've, we've listened and we've heard, and we need to tell it to others as well. So let's, let's stand and sing this. <coughs>
go in peace. Enjoy the rest of this day and the week ahead. And uh, we'll see you, see you soon tonight or Wednesday.